This week, we've heard the contention of UFO researchers that there is a secret government within our government. While that may be hard to believe coming from the UFO perspective, we've certainly learned in Watergate and the Iran-Contra scandal that factions within our government can and do pursue their own hidden agendas outside of the law, outside the control of Congress, or the knowledge of the American people. This is exactly the type of operation we'll hear about tonight. It's a chilling scenario with worldwide implications that may have its roots right here. Area 51, that mysterious corner of the Nevada test site, is no longer much of a secret. The fact that secretive things go on here is a given, even to the Soviets, who make daily spy flights over the facility to take a peek at what's going on. These photos, never before shown in public, are about as close as anyone will ever come to seeing what the place looks like again. The dry bed of Groom Lake, corrugated metal buildings, a three-mile-long runway, and some highly sophisticated radar and detection equipment. It's been known by many names over the years, Dreamland, The Ranch, The Skunk Works. If ever there was a place to test a secret new technology, this is it. And that's exactly what's been done here for decades. 51 is where stealth technology was nurtured, where Star Wars devices are still tested, and where all manner of CIA monkey business has been plotted and refined. It's the perfect place for secret things. But of course, that's no secret. 51 is ringed by the forbidden vastness of the Nevada test site, by the looming Groom Mountains, and by sparsely populated desert expanses. Speculation was heightened in 1984 when the Air Force seized nearly 90,000 acres around Groom Lake. The action was, by most accounts, illegal. During congressional hearings about the land grab, Congressman John Cyberling grilled the military about the legal authority used in the action and was told the authority was at a much, much higher level than the Air Force. Cyberling asked what authority is higher than the laws of the United States. The Air Force official said he could respond, but only in a closed briefing. In 1987, when the Air Force sought to renew its stranglehold on the Groom Range, news articles once again mentioned the talk about alien spacecraft and subsequent articles in national magazines quoted unnamed sources about things of alien origin flying in Nevada, things that would make filmmaker George Lucas drool. Despite the speculation, no one who knew Area 51 from the inside ever talked publicly about the saucer stories. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs, uh, that are out there of extraterrestrial origin. The live interview with the shadowy dentist drew international attention. Portions were broadcast by radio in six European countries and in a nationally televised TV special in Japan. Actually nine uh, flying saucers, flying discs. Despite numerous inquiries and feelers, Dennis has remained anonymous until now. His real name is Robert Lazar a young scientist with eclectic interests. The choice of Dennis was an inside joke. He says that's the name of his superior at Groom Lake. It wasn't a joke to Dennis. He called right after and said, you have any idea what we're going to do to you now? And I, I said, well, no. <laughs> he hung up the phone. Lazar's story is, by any standards, fantastic. He says he's telling it in order to protect himself. He says he was hired to work at an area called S4, which is a few miles south of Groom Lake. At S4, he says, are flying saucers, antimatter reactors, and other working examples of technology that is seemingly beyond human capabilities. Right, this, this came from somewhere else. I mean, as bizarre as that is to believe, but I mean, it's there, I saw it. I know what the current state of the art is in, in, in physics, and it's, it can't be done. Checking out Lazar's credentials proved to be a difficult task. He says he earned degrees in physics and electronics, but the schools we contacted say they've never heard of him. He also said he worked as a physicist at Los Alamos National Lab, where he experimented with one of the world's largest particle beam accelerators, a half-mile-long behemoth capable of generating 700 million volts. Los Alamos officials told us they had no records of a Robert Lazar ever working there. They were either mistaken or were lying. A 1982 phone book from the lab lists Lazar right there among the other scientists and technicians. A 1982 clipping from the Los Alamos newspaper profiled Lazar and his interest in jet cars. It, too, mentioned his employment at the lab as a physicist. We called Los Alamos again. An exasperated official told us he still had no records on Lazar. EG&G, which is where Lazar says he was interviewed for the job at S4, also has no records. It's as if someone has made him disappear. Well, they're trying to make me a non-person. Explain. You called where? Well, the schools that I went to. The hospital that I was born at, uh, past job, 
and uh, essentially nothing comes up with my name in it. He smiles, but out of futility, knowing the whole thing must sound ridiculous. I did not believe that this should be a security matter. Some of it, sure. But just the concept that there's definite proof, and uh, we even have articles from another world, another system. You just can't not tell everyone. Word Knapp, Eyewitness News 8. Are you Robert Scott Lazar? Yes. About whether you have lied about flying saucers or antimatter control, do you intend to answer my questions truthfully? Yes. Did you knowingly lie when you said that you had actually seen anti-gravity propulsion in operation? No. Did you knowingly lie when you said you had seen an antimatter reactor? No. Did you knowingly lie when you said that you actually saw a 30-odd foot gravity-powered flying disc? No. This is the hard part of the story for people to understand. It's uh, they, they, they don't really get a sense of what it was like because really, literally, you had to be there for some of this. I lived through it. I, I know what it was like, what B Bob was going through at that time. They were breaking into his house and playing mind games. You know, they'd leave the doors open, they'd leave drawers open, nothing's taken. They'd write things on his blackboard or erase things, move things around. He goes to the gym with his, with his buddy and he's kind of scared, so he's got an Uzi in his car. He comes out an hour later after working out, the doors to the car are open, the windows are down, the glove box is open, and the Uzi is laying there on the front seat. That wasn't a burglary, that was somebody messing with him. That stuff really happened. It's both uh, frightening and infuriating. Do you, on a deeper level, trust Bob's story now than before what you take away from it 25 years later, after sitting down with Bob and hearing him tell this story with the same details. He's not adding any stuff to it. He doesn't have to worry about remembering the truth because he remembers the same version, the same story, the same way, same details. And he's telling things that actually happened to him. Uh, I tend to, it, it, it carries a lot of weight with me. I, uh, 25 years later, still telling the same story, reluctantly, by the way, this is a reluctant UFO messiah. The only reason he came out uh, to talk to us again is because I bugged him about it uh, relentlessly. Come on, Bob, when are you coming out? Uh, are we there yet? Kind of a, uh, and he finally relented and came out, but he wasn't happy about it. Nothing good comes from the UFO field for him. It does nothing but cause him trouble. If he had to do it over again, I, I suspect he wouldn't do it uh, because it changed his life. 
And there was a part of him, as he said in our most recent conversation, there's a part of them that would really like to still be working on that stuff. I mean, it is really amazing technology, the most amazing technology he's ever seen. I think I believe the story more than it did before. The idea that Bob was a disinformation agent or part of a, a program to mislead the public is wrong. I, he's not. And I can say that after knowing the guy for a quarter of a century. The story he told then is the story he tells now. He didn't add to it. He's not making it more elaborate. Uh, he's not remembering new parts of it. It's the same story. It's consistent all the way through. I had sent resumes to several national labs around the country. Uh, I got a response from a couple of them. They said, we might have something in the near future you would be very interested in. You know, you, you say you work on little projects. I said, yeah, I have a particle accelerator in my master bedroom and, and things of that sort. And uh, some time went by and they called me back in. They said uh, there was a, a senior staff physicist that was leaving. Uh, this organization, and they basically interviewed me for that job. Okay, you, you're there on the first day. What happens on the first day? First day was when I read most of the briefings. 121 of these things. Right. I only had, what, what did they say? Through some reaction, it produces a, a gravity field that's not completely understood. One of the things that they were teaching me was the physics that they connect all this together. To create fields and power such as these disks required to do what they do, to lift off the ground and, um, without a body of a propulsion system, requires just a tremendous amount of energy and this is the only way they can achieve it. But how does that work? I mean, how, how it, does that field become useful? It's the most potent energy source that there can be. Uh, just as a, a rough guesstimate, uh, a kilogram of antimatter is equal in energy to 47 10 megaton hydrogen bombs. It's an extremely potent energy source. It's a direct conversion of matter to energy. If you want to tell the full story of John Lear, you have to cover the story of Bob Lazar. And the only way to do that is to talk to Bob. And I don't know if he'll talk to you or not, but you need to try. Well, it was, it's all going to be circumstance for you, is the moment that you approach him, the mood that he's in, what else is going on in his life at the time. Uh, you might hit the jackpot and get him at exactly the right time and the, the universe is aligned and he's willing to talk about it. But you have to be awfully lucky uh, because in general, Bob doesn't like to talk about it. I think he's very happy in his life. He's happy to have left the UFO stuff behind. He misses his friends. He misses John Lear, he misses Gene Huff, maybe even me to some extent, uh, but he doesn't miss the UFO topic and he doesn't miss talking about it because ultimately it's disturbing. These are disturbing issues. They go to the heart of who we are as people, as human beings, the nature of reality itself. Is this a computer simulation? Are we all the product of an alien video game? or some multi-dimensional movie, drive-in movie theater production or something. Big questions, disturbing answers, and Bob has never been comfortable in talking about them, never. You know, look, <laughs> you can nitpick anything, you know, to the point where you find inconsistencies and then you can add those inconsistencies up and say, you know what, this can't be true. But the thing is, you can do that with factual events. And this was a factual event. Where, I mean, where the project is now, where the parts are now, you know, this is all 20 years ago. So I know there are alien craft here from another planet. I Now, I saw other ones, but I was inside one. I know it was not made on Earth. I know it was made with materials that we cannot 
fabricate, we cannot duplicate, and we've never been able to. I know it uses a power source that's so advanced that you know, we could only dream of something along those lines, and the energy density on it is phenomenal. It's nothing that to, I, I would ever expect to see. Um, I know that you know this is done in the highest levels of security and you know that they use all kinds of methods to keep it quiet from disinformation to uh, uh, I mean th some exotic ways of just hiding things like I said the installation itself was buried in the side of a mountain and you know uh, I also know that there's lots of nonsense information that has gone around and whether it was started by the Navy or military or whoever's at the absolute bottom, you know, of the project. Uh, and I, I truly suspect that be the case because, look, disinformation is the most powerful, you know, way to distort facts. You just throw a bunch of useless stuff out there and, you know, they just take the real facts along with the nonsense and bundle it together and say, well, this is just impossible and, you know, there, your security is maintained. But uh, I also know that at some point they've examined or had bodies of alien creatures somewhere. So I know that stuff for a fact. And mm, that's the bottom line. Well, I am telling the truth. I, I, I've tried to prove that. Uh, what's going on up there could be the most important event in history. You're talking about contact, physical, <laughs> physical contact and proof of, uh, from another another system, another planet, another intelligence. That's got to be the biggest event in history, period. And it's real. And it's real and it's there. Lazar says he has no intention of going on any UFO lecture circuit. He's not looking to do any additional interviews. In fact, he wasn't too crazy about doing this one. He did it after certain unfavorable things started happening in his life, and he did it because he feels that whoever is running the show up at S4 is perpetrating a fraud on the American people and on the scientific community. You believe his story, don't you? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I've gotten to know him uh, pretty well over the last couple of months, and uh, I believe he's telling the truth.